Well, my name is Travis Budd, and I'm your substitute today. <laughs> Hopefully Josh is having a great time up in North Carolina, I believe. Uh, so, okay. Well, I'm also one of the Buds, where we just got the welcome back, and thank you, Patrick, for that. And uh, I'll start out by introducing myself, since I'm a substitute, and I don't preach that much. Uh, um, we've been coming to OCC since 2010. I think I recognize just about everybody in the, in the crowd today. And, uh, and uh, also work over at Edgewood Children's Ranch. So I'm not going to get into the details of Edgewood Ranch, but uh, we spend a lot of time with uh, teenagers who come from all kinds of different situations and everything. And so most of my time that I spend speaking or preaching is in front of, the, in front of kids. And one of the things that I've learned in the last four and a half years of doing that is uh, kids uh, learn a lot from stories as opposed to just straight teaching. It's a very experiential type of thing. And they're, they're a lot more interested in my story or their story or hearing stories. So Joseph has been a really good subject for me this year. And uh, I didn't know it when I uh, got this date that uh, my story would kind of parallel it in, in some ways. So originally I agreed back in January to cover this day for, for Josh, and I had no idea how much I would be relating to, be, to uh, being reunited again. And you see my wife uh, just arrived back on Monday and my, my son Nico as well. And uh, so I really feel very heartfelt about uh, this passage. So I'm going to get into the story, a little bit of my story. Um, back in January, my wife left and was going down for a few weeks to go visit her family for uh, her parents' 50th wedding anniversary. When she was down there, we were doing doctor checkups and stuff because it's a lot cheaper. And for, to make a long story short, she had a lump on her uh, thyroid and had to get it removed. And after she got half her thyroid removed, we were thinking everything's good and, and she'll be on her way back. And uh, I believe it was a Tuesday, I got a call from my wife after everything, thinking we were in the clear, calling me upset because she had found out that there was, uh, it was cancerous, that the tumor. So this was 10 minutes before I had to go back from lunch. And uh, so it kind of kind of hits you like a sledgehammer. And you, you really start thinking all, all kinds of different things. I still remember very clearly hanging up the phone with her after she was upset and like walking back to check in with my boss to see what's going on for the afternoon and just having that really weird feeling, like trying to process all of it. So like Joseph, my, my life, took an unexpected turn. And uh, one of the human nature things is the first things that always seem to come to you is uh, the fearful things. So uh, the things that were going from my mind when I was walking back into lunch and then when I was working and kind of holding the things to myself is uh, how long is this going to keep us separated? You know, how long is it going to keep my wife down there and, and, and my son? Um, the cost. Of course, the cost, you think, oh, man, this is going to get expensive. I only make about $15,000 a year working for a nonprofit. <laughs> so, so any cost can get real expensive real quick. Uh, dangers involved. Should we, should we try and bring her back up? Should we do it in the United States? Should we stay in Mexico? Um, how, how, what's the best way to proceed with those things? And then also uh, the very human thing of uh, struggling uh, with something that you don't think you deserve. You know, when, when something hits you out of left field and, and, uh, and you really have to accept it and, and not try and reject it and try and open your eyes as to what's going on. So as we're paralleling this, through Joseph and the stories here at OCC and spend a lot of time thinking about that. Uh, Sylvia and I spent a tremendous amount of time talking 
Uh, thank you, God, for the technology now. Even five years ago, it was difficult. You had to use phone cards to call back and forth. Now we have the Mexico plan for an extra $5 a month, and you can text and have unlimited phone calls. So it's like calling her like she's in Georgia or somewhere like that. So, <laughs> so we spent a lot of time uh, uh, talking things out and working things through, and really I got to give it to her. She's had a lot of courage because she really got past the why me thing super fast. I was really amazed. Um, but one of the, the verse and the underlying theme that really uh, made that change happen came from uh, Romans 8.28. And uh, I'll go ahead and read it to you. I believe it's in the back. Yep. So, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So, if we're fearful... And the bad kind of fear, and I always say the bad kind of fear in the way that uh, you're, you're putting your faith in bad things to happen. You're putting your faith in evil. Um, you remember that promise that God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And maybe even in, in, a, in, a, in a childlike way, holding on to that, that faith. And, and through our many conversations, at least two times a day we would talk um, we started uh, looking for God and what's going on and uh, really trying to pay attention and, and uh, see the things that, that God was doing through uh, this hardship. And so I made a, made a list of a few things that, uh, that we really had uh, come up with. One, uh, my relationship with Carlos Carlos isn't here today. He, he's been in Mexico for the summer, so he has to catch up on his social life <laughs> before he gets back in school. He's at a birthday party with friends. But uh, as house parents at Edgewood Ranch, uh, three years as house parents, and then also with the birth of Nico, who's going to be three next month, um, Carlos has really kind of had to take a back seat in the family just by default because he's going to public school and then working as house parents we have the kids uh, we get them back from school at 4 p.m. and then we send them to school at 8:30. so Carlos was always on shared time with us he was sharing us with uh, six to eight girls or boys depending on what year it was and uh, and then leaving that to go to relief which is like a substitute house parent that's what I do now um, uh, he spent a lot of time helping out Sylvia with, with Nico. So, so our relationship was constant, but it was a lot more superficial than I ever wanted it to be. So all of a sudden, Carlos and I had each other, and we had our, each other's complete attention. And so that was uh, quite an adventure. Um, it was a little bit challenging for me in the beginning. Carlos is a very introverted kid. It's hard to get him to talk. And then with all the stuff going on with his mom, I, I spent a lot of time uh, trying to pull it out of him, trying to say, how do you feel about this? Oh, it's fine. She said she'll be okay. I'm like, no, I know you feel a lot more than that. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, as time went along, by the, by the time in June when we went down to Mexico to, to go see, we really had a good relationship and we spent a, a tremendous amount of time talking, found a lot of things in common that we enjoyed. And, uh, our relationship has improved hugely. Uh, another thing that it has come from it is uh, to take a pause in your life, where all of a sudden your life for a temporary period of time is going to look different. Uh, Sylvia, in our conversations, we spent a lot of time uh, kind of talking, hashing out where we've been and where we're going. And you get kind of that break from the norm where you get so caught up in the details that you start looking a lot at the big picture. I think uh, we've really spent a lot of time praying and listening to God about where we're going in the future, as well as uh, as really looking back at the past and and uh, even owning our own mistakes in our relationships and and uh, and really trying to uh, take a step in the right direction. Um, appreciation for the life that we're living. You start thinking about all the things that you've had that a lot of times you lose in the details. You start thinking about uh, uh, the comfort that God always has been providing. And you can look back and you see the ways that God has provided so many times. 
um, improved community. Uh, we work at the ranch, and I would say at least half the staff live at the ranch. And uh, hardship really improves community. I think, I think Americans struggle a lot, or first world people struggle a lot because it's such of an individual society and we can afford to be alone. So when you start uh, needing people for costs, needing people for support, needing people for those, it was amazing that it really surprised us. People that we had a good relationship with, but very superficial, and, and all of a sudden you see that caring come out and you start seeing everybody coming out of uh, from all directions in order uh, to help out in any way that they can. And our relationships got so much deeper with so many people here and, and uh, over, at, over at the ranch. So coming forward, that's another huge positive. And I think even with each other, you know, to, to gather around somebody, and, and that's just the definition of body life, is, is to work together, to live together. In that way. <laughs> On a funny note, I became a better housekeeper. <laughs> With Sylvia God, you always think, oh, I'm going to have so much time, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I don't have the baby around hassling me. And uh, I had to sweep the floor. I had to clean every time I would do dishes. I, w I was joking with Sylvia that, that my Saturdays were spent entirely just maintaining all our stuff. And uh, it really gives you an appreciation for uh, what the other does in, in the job when all of a sudden you have to do, do that. Gave me a lot of empathy for single moms. I don't know you, how you, they have a, a small child and maintain a house and a job and everything like that. It's just, I think I would lose my mind. I had a teenager and that, that wasn't so bad because at least he, he can find his own food and can do all those type of things. <laughs> but. The housekeeping thing was a big deal. Uh, that was a, a big one for me, as I'm sure in many marriages that, that can become a point of tension. <laughs> um, and going back to empathy, you start, anytime you go through hardships, you start empathizing a lot more with, with your fellow human beings and uh, people that are dealing with sickness, people that are dealing with anger, people that are dealing with uh, hardships in their lives. So much working with teenagers, the teenagers that we work with come from some really rough situations. And a lot of times it's hard to have the, the patience when they're being so disrespectful or so negative and those things. But you always have to remind, remind yourself that uh, they have that anger down inside that they really have to get, get out and... and uh, even with a small, I always on the surface feel like it, 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 what we were dealing with is such a small thing in comparison to so many other people. But the, your own little hidden frustrations and your own little reactions that you see and you know it's because you're frustrated with your current situation. And it gives you a lot of empathy. Um, empathy with separated families. So much hearing on the news with... Uh, immigration issues that are going on right now and people separating families and stuff. It, it uh, takes a whole different meaning when you're, when you're dealing with your own family being separated across uh, borders. And even with the kids that we work with, uh, uh, dealing with separated families and hardship in their own families or uh, custody issues and those type of things and how, how rough that can be for children. Um, I think we both agree that it, this has given us a deeper prayer life. So um, we spent a lot of time in prayer, prayer together, prayer for each other, um, working on a relationship with God because of that pause in life where you really have to kind of look at everything. And uh, I would say one of the highlights that we came have come to stronger and stronger is just learning to listen. Uh, you always uh, start out with so much to say, but then when you think about who you're, who you're talking with and the creator of all things and, and how important it is that you're listening and that you're looking for God to show up <coughs> in those ways. So I imagine that uh, the story of Joseph going back and how much more and how much stronger it was, the positives that have come out of, of the story. And uh, 
and how God had it set up all along. And I always and I wonder because we're just at Sylvia and I and Carlos and Nico are just at the point that are that's here in Genesis where uh, Joseph and Israel uh, finally are come together. You know that happened last Monday. It was an emotional thing for me to get everybody back in one place, kind of how we how we started, and uh, and where are they gonna where are we gonna go from there? So we have some ideas, and we've been praying, and and uh, we're moving forward to see how much that even though this may have started out as a negative, positives will continue to come out of it. So. Uh, with Joseph, it's the same type of thing. Uh, their very lives being saved and, and uh, going, going to the region of Goshen, as we heard. <laughs> and so it's really interesting to see how God works in these ways. So moving forward and uh, staying with the deeper prayer life, uh, We'll move over to Mark with Jesus, and and uh, Jesus had just finished, as you heard last week, feeding feeding the five thousand five thousand men. And uh, what does he do? He immediately goes off for his his own prayer and staying in communion with God, um, up on the mountainside to pray. And later that night, the disciples uh, were in the middle of the lake, and he and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. Um, there's so many analogies to that picture. How many times do you feel like you're straining, <laughs> straining with the wind against you? And uh, everybody has those examples constantly in life. And I always like to picture that Jesus strolling up on water, walking on water, hopping in the boat, and, uh, and then the wind calms down. It's just one of those where uh, if, you, if you look and you picture that, you think about how easy it is for God, how easy these things are for God, and, and how, how I'm calmly he speaks to them, and take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. So, going back, it just reminds me that God is the creator of all things, and anything is possible with him. And you always have to to leave yourself open for those miracles, for those things that are not probable. You always have to leave yourself, leave leave room for God to to be God and to do these things, to walk across water, to, to calm winds, to do any of those type of things. The other thought that always comes to me is, is uh, that our life is in him, that we get all life from him. And how often do we get distracted with other things? How often do we start subconsciously thinking that our life comes from money or it comes from health or that our life comes from power or status? And uh, you always have to keep yourself rooted in, in where your life comes from. And, and uh, the last sentence really got me, and I pondered it a lot over the last six months. Um, for they were completely amazed. Uh, they had not understood about the loaves, and their hearts were hardened. That's puzzling to me, because you always think, like, if you just watched with the loaves and the fish that Jesus just... Uh, fed 5,000 men, plus however many other women and children, that uh, your hearts were still hardened also. But how many times do we do that in our own lives? How many times do we explain it away? Does he say, were they thinking to themselves, uh, like, Jesus must have known about these loaves and fish that we didn't know about, and he's just <laughs> playing. Like, how could your heart, your heart be hardened? But I, I even know with my own life, when you get some fixated on the battle that you lose the big picture of, of what's going on, how many times do we miss it? How many times do we miss what God's doing? 
I know in my job, I miss it all the time. I find out later, talking to kids that we had been with that uh, come back years later and talk about some moment that was very impactful for them. And you think in the back of your mind, you're like, what, that? When I said that, when I did that, those are, you know. And, and you, miss the, you, you missed it uh, that that was that moment changing thing. And because God's working, uh, a lot of the times it's the, it's the thing that you said, it's a devotion that you did that's more awkward that you don't feel came out right. It always, always the ones that you think that you nailed it, then you don't hear that much. But it's always, but the ones that, <laughs> that you feel like you're awkward and, and moving through it and that, that God's really working and it's not about us. So how many times have my, has my heart been hardened and because I already have my idea of what things are supposed to be and, uh, and not looking for what they are. So I'll leave you guys with that thought about uh, listening and looking and not leaving your heart, your heart hard. Fear does that to you, and uh, it's good to fear in the sense of conf- consequences for your actions, but it's bad to fear in the sense that you're putting your faith in, in bad things to happen because God has the potential to do anything and everything.